Hey there, and welcome back to XCOM. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode in our XCOM Enemy Within Iron Man Impossible walkthrough, an episode that will take us right to the end of the second in-game month. And our first task in today's episode was already laid out for us in the last video, where we more or less simultaneously shut down an alien UFO and get wind of an alien terror mission in South Africa. We took care of the high-stakes terror mission first to ensure a fully healthy six-soldier squad, and we succeeded, got the excellent rating in that mission, unlocked another achievement, and brought everyone back home safely. So today, we could start things off by jumping right into the action with the UFO mission, but before we do that, let's make a quick stop in engineering first. Our worst suspicions may have been true after all. They're not just here for abductions. They have something else in mind. With Dr. Shen worrying about the alien's big master plan, we now purchase another laser pistol. We have the cash, the engineers and the alloys to comfortably afford one, and there is at least one more soldier in our squad who should have one at this point. With the purchase being made, we can now head back into mission control and focus on our next mission. With a bit of luck, we shot down a medium-sized UFO over Argentina in the last episode, which is actually the first medium-sized UFO we have ever encountered in this playthrough. Before we get going, let's take care of that laser pistol first, and its recipient will be Sniper George Teasdale. Thanks to his snapshot ability, he is able to fire his sniper rifle even after moving, but that rifle won't do him any good if enemies are in close range to him, so for him, the pistol can be a very handy backup weapon. Central, this is Big Sky. Strike One is ready to secure the craft. Copy, Big Sky. Strike One is clear to attempt the breach. Alright, no open fields or forests this time, instead we are in the middle of a ruined building. This definitely increases the amount of cover that is available, while for the moment, despite its size, the UFO is nowhere to be seen. So, in our very first turn, we can move up Rosilius a bit, who I actually wanted to use a battle scanner with, but who has now unfortunately already detected the first nest of enemies. Three floaters have been activated, and for now they're keeping their distance and they're spreading out as well, so we probably won't be able to solve this quickly with explosives. We will also not really be able to get into good firing positions on this turn with the rest of the squad, so instead we'll play this a bit more defensively. First of all, we will move Emilia into half cover and closer to the enemies. This is of course a risky position for her to be in, but bear with me for a moment. Up next, we'll use a simple dash action with Adam to get him into full cover and also closer to the action. And as he advances, we also catch a glimpse of the first melt container. Heavy Andrea Cook can then also dash into half cover between Adam and Emilia, while our other heavy Shoji Jang dashes as well, but stays back a bit further. And with five of our six soldiers grouped closely together, it is now time to use Emilia's improved smoke grenade. This will give everyone a plus 40 to their defense, which together with the cover that everyone is in should make them extremely hard to hit. Sniper George Teasdale is the only one staying out of the cloud. He will keep an eye on the right flank for us, but for now he will also hunker down to increase his defense. Rosilius, meanwhile, is protected by the smoke and half cover, which counts as full for him, and he still has an action left, so let's switch over to the pistol and activate Overwatch. As expected, no one's taking aim just now, the first floater here goes on Overwatch, while the second one goes airborne and catches an Overwatch of its own. Rosilius's laser pistol only does one point of damage and the floater now lands in an inconvenient position right behind our lines, but at least he's unable to take a shot on this turn. The third floater then moves up and takes aim, but only goes for suppression fire, so Mr. Wargal now takes a heavy penalty to his aim and probably should not move as well. To make matters even worse, we have two sectoids appear on the left flank, but for now they only move into cover and keep their distance. So, here we are, with a floater in our bag, a second one suppressing our sniper and a third one on overwatch, and with two sectoids waiting to engage from the flank. Not an ideal position to be in, but with six soldiers, one that we should be able to solve. And we'll start things off with Emilia, who has a very good chance to hit the overwatching floater, and also a solid chance to hit a critical because the floater is not in cover. And wonderful, that is the overwatch removed, which should make things a lot easier for us. Up next, we can then use Adam's run and gun ability to take care of the suppressing floater, as Adam dashes right into a flanking position and can then use rapid fire for up to two guaranteed hits. One is already enough though, and that leaves only the floater in the back. 
And since the two guys closest to him are only our two snipers, Teasdale and Wargal, we will instead go with Shoji Jang, who has a bit more close range firepower. On my way. He lands another critical, and that is all of the floaters taken care of. All we have remaining at this point are the two sectoids on our left. To avoid getting flanked, Andrea moves to the other side of the concrete block here, which then puts herself into a flanking position. A 72% hit chance is not the best, but we'll take it. Maybe we get another lucky kill here. Right, the shot hits, but it fails to eliminate the sectoid, so let's bring in some reinforcements. His squad side ability does not do Resilius any good in his current position, but if we move him a bit closer, his high accuracy rating might allow him to land a shot with his pistol. And indeed it does, that is the fourth enemy on this turn eliminated as well. Now only one sectoid remains and that one is currently hidden, so let's move sniper George Teasdale into cover and put him on overwatch, maybe that is already enough to lay a trap for the sectoid. And while that sectoid emerges on its turn, it is smart and stays in full cover, and it even manages to get off a shot at Emilia. Luckily though, the shot goes wide and that means we can end this right here and now. As you may remember, Andrea recently picked up the Grenadier ability, and that means her grenades now do 4 instead of 3 points of damage. And those 4 points are all we need to get the kill here, so let's begin our third turn on this mission with a neat explosion. And there we go, that's 5 hostiles taken out already, roughly half of what I expect us to find on this mission. As we have no more enemies in sight, we can now also grab the melt with Adam, while Sniper George Teasdale moves up to the first floor of the building here to gain some high ground. And since we find no enemies up here, the rest of our squad can advance on the ground. Shoji Jang follows Adam closer to the meld. Emilia dashes into full cover near the destroyed doorway. While Rosilius moves into half cover behind her and then throws a battle scanner through the exit of the building to see what lies ahead. Eagle Eye on the move. He does not uncover any hostiles though, but we can already see the faint outlines of the alien UFO here, which means that more enemies might be nearby, so let's reload Adam's shotgun in anticipation of what's to come. The aliens remain quiet on this turn though, and deep in the fog we can now also see the faint outlines of the second melt container. We likely still have a few turns to get there though, so let's not be too hasty here. To get us started on this turn, Emilia will move from one doorway to the other and remain in full cover, while Heavy Jang will dash to catch up and take a peek around the corner. However, he only confirms what the battle scanner already revealed, there are no enemies in our close vicinity. Because the first floor of the building here also seems to be empty, we can move Resilius up there as well now. Having both snipers in elevated positions might give us an advantage later. Assault Adam Work will stay close to Jang, and even though we don't see anyone yet, it can't hurt to be careful, so let's switch over to the pistol to give him a bit more range and then activate Overwatch. Heavy Andrea will move into half cover behind the building's exit, that way she could in theory fire a rocket to the outside on the next turn. Sniper Teasdale will then also move a bit closer to the UFO, but he will stay on Overwatch as well, just to be on the safe side. On the aliens' turn then, we have Seekers coming in from the left. It seems like they were just out of the battle scanner's reach, and it also seems like their stealth mode is not really working as advertised. This was already something I noticed in the last abduction mission, and here it happens again, causing the Seeker to remain uncloaked, which then allows Emilia to take a reaction shot. She hits for 4 points of damage, but we're not done yet, Adam will also take a shot with his pistol now. However, he misses his target and the Seeker remains afloat, however, also in plain sight. And I admit at this point I would be very interested to learn why this is happening. I have played through this game numerous times now, but this is the first time I encounter this, so if any of you have an explanation for it, then please let me know. Now, since they are airborne, the two Seekers will not be that easy to hit for our troops on the ground, but luckily we have two snipers in an elevated position. As we move George into full cover, he conveniently enough also reveals the second Seeker further in the back, and his chance to hit that one is actually substantially higher, so let's use his headshot ability here to land an almost guaranteed critical. Alright, that's the first Seeker down, the other one is still up but it only has two hit points, so let's bring Rosilius a bit closer, who also has some full cover in front of him, and who can now use this position to land a guaranteed hit and maybe even the kill with his laser pistol. 
and he hits for 3 points of damage and that is more than enough to get the kill here. Admittedly though, due to the Seeker's strange stealth behavior, this fight was probably a bit easier than it should have been. Nonetheless, let us use the rest of this turn to move closer to the ship and also to the melt container. And as we do that with Adam, we not only properly reveal the melt, but also the rather advanced timer on it, which gives us only two more turns, including this one, to secure the melt. So let's move Adam up a bit further. With a run and gun, he should then be able to grab the melt on the next turn. Heavy Andrea Cook exits the building as well, moves into half cover again and then reloads her LMG, while Heavy Jang continues to remain close on Adam's heels and then also goes for the reload. Reloading. Emilia can get into position on the left side and also reload her laser rifle, and that completes our turn. Reloaded. The aliens don't make a move and we also don't hear any of them, but the spaceship is fairly large so there might be a few of them hidden further in the back. For now though, the coast is clear and we'll use that to activate run and gun with Adam and to then grab the second melt container of this mission. In hand, Commander. He can then activate Overwatch with his shotgun while Emilia moves closer to the UFO as well, and even though we don't see any hostiles here, she will also stay in cover and activate Overwatch. To catch up with the front line, Sniper Wargal will cover a bit more ground with a dash, while Heavy Cook remains a bit more cautious and gets herself into cover again, and then also goes on Overwatch. Our second sniper, George Teasdale, will dash just like Resilius, and the same is true for Heavy Jang, who will, as usual, stay close to Adam. Moving to designated position. On the alien's turn, we once again don't see or hear anything, so it might be that we only have the outsider still left to defeat, but even if that's the case, we have to find it first. For this purpose, we move Teasdale a bit closer to the ship's entrance, but the look inside reveals not much more than empty space. Still, we can't be too careful, so let's make use of our second battle scanner, as Resilius is the first who properly enters the ship, as he then throws a battle scanner through the energy field in front of him and towards the middle of the ship. Sweeping. That reveals a few more doors on the inside as well as a potential back entry over here, but most importantly, no signs of any enemies whatsoever. That entrance over in the back, however, looks very intriguing, so we'll have Adam and Shoji come closer to investigate. They probably won't be able to enter the ship on the next turn, but with both melt containers collected, we are not in a hurry. Meanwhile, the rest of the squad will move over to the left side of the ship, starting with Andrea, who can dash into half cover here. Sniper Teasdale, meanwhile, stays put and goes on overwatch, while Emilia dashes over to the door leading into the next room. And once again, despite heading deeper and deeper into the ship, we don't hear any alien movement, so at this point I'm pretty sure that we only have to find the outsider. Our two-man squad in the back then begins this turn by moving closer to the ship's rear entrance, but even with a full dash, they're not quite able to enter just yet. Meanwhile, on the other side of the ship, Andrea now also gets in position near the door, while Rosilius grabs himself a slightly better vantage point and goes on overwatch, and George keeps an eye on the corridor in the middle of the ship. Heading to that location. Emilia stays put and doesn't do anything apart from overwatching on this turn, but once again there is nothing to shoot at as whatever aliens are left remain hidden. So time to move our boys into position in the back of the ship. They will both cover the door here and then take a peek inside on the next turn. With everyone in position, the door over on the other side can be opened right now though, and as we do, we finally find the outsider who had been hiding right behind it. Instead of retreating, it also dashes into the room that we already occupy, which means we should not have a hard time killing it, and since Emilia is closest, she will get the first shot. We nailed it, Commander. Mission accomplished. And here we go, with alien kill number 125 of this playthrough, we complete Operation Frozen Grave. Another UFO has been brought down and its crew defeated, while our squad did not suffer a single loss. Our troops really came through on this one. I'm glad everyone made it back safely. Back in the base, we hear a few praising words from Dr. Valen and we also have one single promotion to take care of. So let's do that right away and advance Heavy Shoji Jang to Captain. And based on the abilities we have chosen so far, the choice between Grenadier and Danger Zone is an easy one for him. While Grenadier is a handy standalone ability, Danger Zone works very nicely with his already existing skill set, and for that reason, we will select it here and complete the only promotion in today's episode. 
Since this was an alien UFO mission, the list of loot is a bit more substantial than usual. Apart from various types of alien corpses, we also recovered 22 units of Illyrium and 74 alien alloys, as well as two UFO flight computers and then two more that are damaged, alongside two damaged power sources. Now, it's a bit of a shame that we were unable to recover any intact power sources, but we'll have to make do with what we have. The damaged items will at least fetch a good price on the grey market, so let's quickly sell both flight computers and both power sources for a decent profit of 100 credits. And that's it, if I'm not completely mistaken, we should have just completed the final mission of this month, so all we have left to do at this point is to scan ahead until the end of April. On the 27th then, our engineers finished their excavation projects, and with more spaces to build in, let's quickly head over to engineering to see what we can do. Before we build anything, we will continue excavating, we definitely have enough cash to do that, and then, looking at our rather problematic power situation, we really only have one facility that is an option at this point. So, right below the two already existing power generators, we will now construct a third one. This one will also benefit from the adjacency bonus, and for 60 credits, it's very much affordable. And not only that, it is technically the only building that we can construct at the moment. Now that construction is underway, however, we can return to mission control and resume the scanning process. Facility online. All right, our cybernetics lab has just been constructed, which means we can now start building mech troopers. So let's head over there and do exactly that. The soldiers who volunteer for mech trooper augmentation sacrifice much, but they do not leave themselves entirely behind. A mech trooper will be able to apply some of the training and knowledge from his or her previous combat specialty to the cybersuit's operation. With this facility, we'll be able to build mechanized exoskeletal cybersuits, or mechs, and implant our soldiers with the cybernetic interfaces they'll need to deploy these mechs onto the battlefield. All right, Dr. Shen already explained most of the process here. We will in just a moment start augmenting our very first soldier to become a mech trooper. No, mech troopers are not entirely artificial robots. There is still a soldier inside the mechanized exoskeletal cybersuit. Augmentation is also a bit of a euphemism in my opinion, because it's not like the soldier inside simply puts that suit on. No, instead they will get all of their limbs amputated and then replaced with mechanized ones. This enables them to use some pretty powerful weapons and equipment, but as you can imagine, the changes are permanent. So this begs the question, who should we augment? As you can see here, only 7 of our 14 soldiers are eligible, because rookies cannot be turned into mech troopers. I also really like our 6-person squad that we have gone with in the last few missions, so let's not make any changes there and instead go with support Nicholas Mahoney. Augmentation is then not too expensive, it only costs 10 credits and 10 units of melt, and depending on what class the soldier belonged to prior to augmentation, he or she even gets a neat little bonus. As a former support, Nicholas will have the Distortion Field ability, which gives a plus 10 bonus to defense for all nearby allies in cover. Augmentation will then take 3 days and like I said, it's a permanent process, but I'm sure one that we will not come to regret. We'll consult with Dr. Valen for the requisite amputations and begin installing the cybersuit interfaces as soon as possible. And with that, we are now fast approaching the end of the month. Up next, we have the launch of our three new satellites, so let's scan ahead until those have been constructed. Commander, our satellite is prepped and standing by for launch. We are ready to deploy it on your orders. And here we are, three new satellites are now waiting to be deployed, and the satellite uplink that will enable us to do that has also just been constructed. So let's head on over to the Situation Room and get those satellites in orbit. All countries with a panic level of 5 that don't have satellites yet will get one here, so with a bit of luck we should once again be able to keep everyone on board. The first satellite will be launched above the US, making it already the second one above North America. Satellite launched. And conveniently enough, satellite number 3 can go up above Mexico, which means we now have satellite coverage for the entire continent. Satellite launched. And as a result, we unlock the All Together Now achievement, as well as North America's continent bonus, Air and Space. 
Now, it remains to be seen how long we'll have access to that, because Canada also has a panic level of 5, and if the satellite does not provide a reduction at the end of the month, there is a good chance the country will leave the XCOM project. But there isn't anything else we can do to help the country at this point, now we only have to hope for Lady Luck to be on our side. The third and final satellite will then go up above Japan, which makes it the first one in orbit above Asia. Satellite uplink facilities at maximum capacity. Additional uplink required. We've been picking up some odd transmissions lately. Some nut calling himself Commander Straker has been all over the news ranting about shadow operatives. With the launch of our first satellite here, we also get the notification that we have no interceptor station in Asia. But since we just unlocked the air and space bonus, we can now do something about that. Well, we could have done so earlier as well, but it would have cost us significantly more money. The air and space continent bonus, however, cuts the acquisition and maintenance costs for interceptors in half. So the fighter that was previously 40 credits is now available for only 20. At the same time, we saw in the last episode how a single interceptor will not be enough to shoot down some of the larger UFOs that will appear in the future, so it might make sense to slightly increase our fleet. So for 20 credits each, we will now add a second interceptor to every continent, except for Asia where we had no satellite coverage prior to this episode, and where we will now purchase two. Right, and that was our very last purchase in today's episode. The new fighters will take three days to arrive in our hangar, so in the meantime we can't do anything else but to advance until the end of the month and to our second council report. Incoming transmission. And here we are, April is officially over now, so let's see what the council has to say about our performance in this month. We are extremely impressed with the progress of the XCOM project thus far, Commander. Your recent results were beyond our expectations, and that is not a statement this council makes lightly. Alright, once again we receive an A grade and Canada is in large parts responsible for that, because despite only having a 50% chance to receive one, they did get a panic reduction, and as a result, the entirety of North America is still part of the XCOM project and we also maintain the air and space continent bonus. With only one more satellite in the next month, we could then already obtain the very useful We Have Ways continent bonus from South America, but looking at the overall panic levels and satellite distributions, I think we'll probably have our hands full with Europe and Asia. Remember, we will be watching. All in all though, I do think that we are in a fantastic position at this point. I admit I had not expected this playthrough to go this well. The strange seeker behavior is giving me some slight worries, but apart from that, I am very optimistic for the month that lies ahead of us. With that being said, I think we have reached a perfect point to make the cut in today's episode. Even though you had to wait for it a while, I still hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, then I would be happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you want to support me and my channel further, then you can of course also subscribe if you haven't done so already, or you can also check out and maybe pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.